we will move to our first session in which our CEO, Ms. Townsend Fian, will provide a short overview on the DSA before moderating a panel of experts who will share their thoughts on the importance of transparency within the DSA. Good afternoon, Tawny, and over to you. Hi, Constantine, can you hear me? Absolutely. All right, now, I'm, now I'm set up. Thank, thanks very much. Thanks for the, for the handover. I'd like to introduce my panelists. Whoops, that wasn't supposed to happen. And, and then to run through a couple of slides about the Digital Services Act proposal. The proposal is 89 pages, and it seems like there was an outside chance that not everybody attending today had read the whole thing. And so we thought we'd put everyone on, on a sort of equal information level at the start, and, and then we'll have our discussion. First and most important, the, my panelists. I will start with, I'll go start with Mar Marisa Jimenez Martin, Director of Public Policy and Deputy Head of EU Affairs at Facebook in Brussels. So Marisa could turn on her video and wave or, or not as she wishes. Stefan Rangelovic, Director Digital Risk and Brand Safety Group M EMEA. And, and Lise Nodka, Senior Vice President, Technology and Data at Bertelsmann and who also sits on our, on our board. I hope everybody can see everybody. I will now, if the team could, could throw up the slides, I will, I think I have five of them. And it's best if you put your, yeah, put the participants down at the bottom of your screen. So I thought it was interesting to put, compare DSA and DMA or, or put DSA a little bit in the context of these two proposals that are often talked about together. It came out roughly at the same time and were discussed a lot together um, in the course of last year. So the Digital Services Act has the objective to ensure a safe, predictable, trusted online environment, and it clarifies liability, liability of intermediate, intermediary service providers for illegal content, products, and services, and imposes certain obligations on them to encourage, to improve user safety and, and societal safety. It's also about, about illegal hate speech. It has an essentially B to C focus. This is, a, it has arisen in part out of a, a long ref reflection on revision of the e-commerce directive. So it's a, essentially B to C consumer protection focus. And the stakeholders that are most evidently impacted are intermediary service providers with sort of subsets of that broad group of intermediary service providers comprising hosting service providers, online platforms, and very large online platforms, the smallest subset. The DMA, by contrast, has a bit more of a market structure focus, a B2B focus, and, uh, and less of a B2C or, or consumer outcome focus. The purpose of the DMA is to ensure contestable and fair markets for the provision of a set of services that are identified as core platform services. As I say, it's B2B and the main players impacted are the gatekeepers and then uh, companies that look like set to become gatekeepers between a hinterland of commercial suppliers and, and a, a market of consumers who look like becoming gatekeepers in the future, in the, in the near future. So the two proposals are, are different and complement complementary. And we're going to just talk about the DSA today. So next slide, please. As I said, the, the main players impacted by the DSA proposal are these intermediate service providers. And within, within that broad group, there are these three, three subgroups, hosting service providers, online platforms, and very large online platforms. And the proposed regulation sets out a set of quite rather minimal obligations for the broad group of intermediate service providers, and then increasingly adds on to those, to that minimum level of requirements, some extra requirements for each of the other, each of the other groups, all of which are cumulative. So the very large online platforms um, have the largest number of obligations. Next slide, please. So very quickly, the set of obligations that accrue to all intermediate service providers are, as I say, reasonably minimal. They need to designate a point of contact and a legal representative in the EU if they are targeting EU consumers. 
They need to ensure that their terms and conditions mention any content moderation policies. So that means policies that how they might take down or control content that they host. And they need to publish annual reports on any ways in which they, any of this content moderation, any examples of where they've interfered in something that was posted for whatever reason. So then the second set of obligations, which accrues to that second group of hosting service providers, this group needs to set up mechanisms to allow third parties, that could be a private person or an organization, to notify them if there appears to be illegal content on their service. And then if the hosting service provider takes action to, to uh, remove that content, it needs to explain to the person who, who flagged the content and the person who, the person who posted the content why it was removed. And then decisions of that type that are taken need to be publicized so that um, everybody understands going forward what the, what the rules are. So then the third set of obligations accrues to the online platforms in addition to the previous two. And the online platforms then have to set up internal complaint handling systems. They need to be willing to participate in out-of-court dispute settlement. They need to be willing to prioritize trusted flaggers. When they get complaints coming in, they need to give priority to the ones that are coming from officially uh, designated trusted flaggers. They need to ensure traceability of traders, so know your uh, customer. They need to publicly report the numbers of disputes that are submitted and settled, numbers of suspensions imposed, and any use made of auto automated content moderation as opposed to uh, human intervention. And then there's some obligations with respect to online advertising transparency, which we'll get to. And then finally, there is the, the set of obligations that in addition to all the others accrue to the VLOPs. I don't know if anyone calls them that, but I've been calling them that, which is risk assessment and mitigation, independent audits of their compliance by a third party, information to be provided about the parameters that are used in algorithmic recommender systems and options for um, private users to modify any parameters that are used in connection with personalization of their experience, creation of re repositories of ads shown during the past 12 months, and then codes of conduct that go beyond the online advertising transparency requirements cited in the paragraph above. So most of these obligations actually don't superficially have anything to do with advertising. But, but just to set the, uh, set the scene, next slide, please. With respect to advertising, there are basically three, three articles, Article 24, Article 30, and Article 36. Next slide. And then I just have a little breakdown of what each of those articles says. So Article 24 just builds on requirements in the existing e-privacy directive, which already requires that an advertisement be, 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 ev it, that it be evident that an ad is an ad, that a commercial communication is a commercial communication that the new requirements are that it must be made evident to a consumer on whose behalf the advertisement has been displayed. And then com consumers ought, to, ought also to get meaningful information about why they got the ad, about the main parameters used to, in order to determine why they got the ad, who gets which ad. Next slide. And then there is article 30 then concerns the very large online platforms that have to do, have some specific advertising related requirements. They must maintain repositories that show all that contain all the ads they have shown during the previous 12 months, the natural or legal persons on behalf, on whose behalf each ad was shown, you know, how long each ad ran, whether the ads were targeted, and if so, according to what, what logic, and then information on no, just numbers of people, anonymized numbers of people who saw each ad. And then I think this is the last slide, Article 36, interestingly, encourages industry to develop codes of conduct that would provide for transparency about advertising that goes even beyond the elements that I just cited in these two previous articles. And, and those codes should lay down how information is to be communicated to users and how uh, the information required for the repositories is to be put together and stored. So I think that's the last slide. See if there's anything else. No, what so with that with that scene setting, I thought I would let me get the um, get the conversation going.
I would be, I'd be interested, maybe I'll start with Stevan. So as I said, it, it's not in the main about advertising, the DSA, but it's obviously part of the story, presumably in, in part because of the perceived connection between advertising and online disinformation. I'd be interested to know whether you feel the, the transparency obligations that, that we just looked at in those three articles seem to be the right ones. Does the does looking from where you sit, does it seem, does the inclusion of advertising in the DSA proposal that we've seen thus far seem to be the right, the right one? And is it even maybe an opportunity for the industry? Thank you, Dominic. That's a big question. So when I think about advertising in DSA, I think of two things, two columns, if you'll. One is the content of advertising. What does the advertising carry? And two is what uh, who what are what kind of data are you using to inform the the advertising the advertising targeting i personally am not surprised because advertising is included in the in, in the proposal because we have seen in the past that there have been abuses of the system in both in in, in both ways that does not mean that is the general industry practice, it's just that some highlighted bad practices that happened may have brought the regulator to introduce such a, to introduce those 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 requirements. Are they going to help? We already have quite a lot of legal frameworks in place and also industry self-regulation that we're going to speak potentially uh, a bit later that address specifically many of these things. But nevertheless, I, I stand firm that I do think that the industry should embrace more transparency. I don't think it's, if it's, I don't think we should be asking a question whether we should embrace it, but how and potentially that's a real question, how to ensure that we don't have the uh, inflation of, in, of information and transparency so much that we fatigue people into not reading and not understanding and simply not caring. Yes, transparency, potentially just seeing the cross match with other stuff. That's good. That's a good phrase, inflation of information. How about, Chris, how, how does it look from, from where you sit? How do you see the inclusion of advertising and is, is this proposal of particular interest to Berlsman and, and what do you think about, about what's been slotted in, at least from the commission side on with, to do with advertising? Tony, I believe that it's been a, it's been already quite a long in, in terms of trying to get many of the legislative elements actually come into place. And if we sit here and I'll look at DSA isolated, I think we would not really make any meat here. As Bertelsmann, I can only say we've got a lot of publishing businesses on the one side with RTL and, and many other, let's say, media businesses, but also e-commerce and services business going alongside there. So I look at this always very much on the complete value chain. And there we see um, a lot of different impacts through this. So actually, it's very important that DSA is making this approach, that we have this kind of enhanced uh, liability regime and that we are trying to get the digital space a really trustworthy place. So I think it's a really key element here. I do believe that overall, especially in the digital advertising sector, as Stefan was also going into this now, I, I believe that we've got too many areas at the moment afloat that makes it very complicated for us actually as a publisher or any any other offering in the digital space to actually come to terms and actually offering this detail granularity as you was just going through the paragraphs I believe that if we are honest to each other, the user still doesn't really know how to follow the tracking elements of advertising, but he does want to have some kind of control. So I would love to take a step back at some given point to actually say, what tools do you really need to give the user and the consumer so that he actually really understands on what's going on? So I think also mentioning what Stefan was, was, was heading towards, I think we need to make this understandable and comprehensible for the user. And then we actually are able to make this usable also for the customer and make the monetization model that all the publishers need. So I don't think it's the greatest idea to now make doom and gloom about targeted advertising in this space, now a part of the DSA, but I do understand the discontent of the uh, regulator as we, as an industry, need to make a, a better offering there that is not creating new gatekeepers, but actually making the choice and the value offering clear to the consumer. And then I think give them the controls as well as having controls actually as an industry for the bad actors and the, the shady parts of the business that we also want to not have within our ranks. I think that's the clear message of the DSA. 
Thanks. Thanks a lot in there too. Marissa, from Facebook's um, perspective, is there are there points you'd like to add to um, what the colleagues have, have already called out? Yes, thank you. I think that they both have touched upon very important points. I'd just like to add to that. The, the fact that advertising is part of the DSA also is an opportunity for this sector. And I think that this is not only for ad tech or publishers or advertisers or tech companies or platforms, it's for all of us to really take responsibility as a sector, as the advertising ecosystem once again, to bring those solutions to the table. I do think, for instance, on, on something that has happened today, which is the EC recommendations on misinformation. So for people who are not familiar and watching now, really they're trying, the, the commission is giving some guidance as how harmful content like misinformation should be addressed in Europe. It's not legislation yet. It's still self-regulation, but it is really a step before that DSA comes into practice. And what's really interesting about that is the focus that the uh, European Commission is making, not to say there's one single part that has all the problems. It's not only about the platforms, it is about the ecosystem. It's, it, it, it is about the brands and the ad tech and the advertisers and the platforms. So I do think this is it's a, we should see this as a great opportunity for the sector from now until those provisions are actually adopted probably in a year or two uh, from now. It's, I, I, I didn't mention in the, in the opening, I, I thought at the beginning of setting these two proposals, DSA and DMA, also in the context of e-privacy and GDPR, because obviously a huge amount of information is, is communicated to users either directly in consent UIs or other UIs to establish a legal basis for processing of personal data under, under GDPR, accessing advice under e-privacy. There's a ton of information goes out either directly in the UI or in the, or in the pr privacy policy. And, and I, I think in, indeed, if you look in the detail of, of um, what's required under Articles 13 and 14 GDPR, you could de certainly derive a, a lot of what seems to be being looked for now in the DSA. Are there other efforts that any of you would like to call out, either that your companies or others in your, in your space in the ecosystem are involved in, other efforts to provide transparency beyond the exhaustive mind-numbing amount of information that's required by privacy and, and data protection law? Are there good examples anyone would like to call out about information disclosures that are a little bit more in the neighborhood of the, why did I get this ad and the, these non, strictly speaking, privacy and, and data protection disclosures? Maybe I can start. I think, I think that you said, let's talk about new innovations other than why, why are you seeing this ad or I, I, so I, we can talk a little bit more about that, but I would really like to, to really call the attention that this might seem innovations that are deja vu, that everyone knows about, but it has taken so much for this industry to get to that point where we, you know, a few years ago, who would have said that a user could have information about why that user is receiving that ad and exact and, and the reasons, the exact reasons why there in one click next to on the same screen with no other burden than that. I think that the entire industry has gone in that journey to provide not only user control and more transparency, but a key thing here, which is the user experience also in ads. And I think that there's still a lot to do, but I wouldn't, I think that this is a really big step forward that the industry has done in last years. I like to just touch upon one point in terms of innovations, which is on transparency, which is the ads library in the case of Facebook. And I think that some of the provisions that we're seeing on the DSA today with respect to transparency and, and advertising probably also are based or the spirit of it is, is also based or founded on some of the things that the industry is already doing. In our case, Facebook with the ads library, uh, both for political ads and for commercial ads. It's true that the DSA goes a little bit beyond in that it no longer distinguishes, at least at this stage, between 
political advertising and commercial advertising, but the aspect of having an ad library where people can see the ads associated to a page and including in political ads who that ad comes from and the fact that we have an authorization process to give a fundamental uh, or essential information about the location, the audience, the amount spent in the area of political advertising. It is an innovation that comes from industry, a best practice from a company, then an industry practice, and then now we have in a draft law. So it's interesting to see that these things don't come out of the blue. They really are built on what we as an industry have tried uh, before. Thank you. Chris or Stefan, are there good examples, are there best practices of information disclosure, either in the privacy space or, or, or non-privacy? I can jump in here. From my perspective, I think it's, it's also from IEB Europe's perspective, I think we've given a, a lot of emphasis on, on creating a, the transparency on consent framework over the last years. And I think that is one of these very the lighthouse pillar kind of projects that have really been created to make sure that uh, from a back-end perspective, the industry is able to transact the data. I think what is the, the bigger challenge actually now looking forward is also making that kind of recognizable also from a front end, from a user perspective. And I think there, there's a, a, still a lot of work to be done from each uh, of the players. And I, I would wish that we are able to find a better common ground to actually make this transparent because it is quite, let's say, um, a tug of war, I would say, in terms of the interest between all the different uh, players in this in this space. But I think we, we see this now coming so close and becoming so urgent that there need to be more elements um, of usability out there so that the user really has the choice. And I can also just uh, repeat maybe or throw in the European NetID Foundation that we've been part of actually at the big, right from the beginning with um, several other European companies out there and actually making, especially in, starting in Germany, where the user has a login that he can control across different properties. And I think that's a very neutral, let's say, foundation that is organizing this and taking such a concept, for instance, would be also something that could be also a part across the ecosystem with all the big players and actually involved to actually make the user this choice that, <laughs> as you were, as I was just mocking a little bit around the, the different, let's say, how long have I been viewing this advertising? advertisement or as Marissa was saying, uh, advertising library. I think we, if we look at it, it needs to be even simpler than that. I think the users just want to really have very basic tools that they are able to see why I'm, be I'm being tracked or where does it come from. Switch it off if I want to do this somehow. Um, and I think there we are still not there yet on having that concept that we can give to the user. So I think that's why we need to put our heads together taking different initiatives that we have, the, the regular, regulatory, self-regulatory, let's say, elements, the code of conduct that is also being discussed in, on these various levels, but actually make it an offer towards the consumer. Stephen, anything to, anything to add from Group M's perspective? Did we lose Stephen? It can happen even at the best events, but he'll probably, he'll hopefully dial back in. Ironically, as we make these investments and, and struggle to strike the balance between comprehensiveness and specificity on the one hand and intuitiveness and simplicity and user-friendliness on the other, and something that even the data protection authorities seem to bring different perspectives to, and in spite of the you know, immense amount of effort that, has, that goes into this work, the DSA, as you guys know, has become the opportunity or the occasion of a debate about a, a, a blanket prohibition on tar targeted advertising, on uh, personalization. I think there, there are different terms thrown around. I think there's no clear definition, and, and that might be an issue that makes the impact even worse than um, it's, it's originally intended. Does it seem a, a surprise to you that this proposal with these rather positive provisions that suggest an important role, continuing role for advertising in the funding and provision of intermediary services, does it surprise you that this discussion would trigger a, a interest in a ban? And do, do you think the people who are principally in the European Parliament who are taking the opportunity to suggest a ban 
understand what the impact would be on, 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 on European media and on, on the provision of other valuable services. How about, Stevan, welcome, welcome back. Did you hear the whole, did you hear the whole question or just uh, part of it? I'm afraid I, I did not, I apologize. My laptop just decided to restart due to systematic error. So right. apologies. No, no, no trouble. So, so how about one of the other colleagues and does it surprise you that we're, we got e-privacy e discussions and apparently mostly converging on, a, on a, a sane outcome that would allow life to go on and, and DPAs in the context of GDPR implementation also con converging on an, an approach to cookie walls that leaves some space to, to run businesses. Does it surprise you that we're um, ha having a discussion about, about a ban in the context of the DSA now and what do you think we can do about it? Marissa. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure how to agree with that. Okay. It doesn't surprise, it doesn't surprise me. I don't think it doesn't surprise a lot of people, but at the same time, it just makes us reflect once again about the fact that the objectives that this ban <laughs> wants to address is, are, are, are valid objectives. So there's legitimate concerns. It's not legitimate, it's not legitimate. What is not proportionate is the solution proposed for this. So I think that we need, really need to distinguish between that, the ban as a solution and the objectives that it's trying to address. I think that we have discussed targeted advertising for a long time, for many years, all of us, in the context of privacy and data protection. Among other things, because that was the piece of legislation that, that really was the first one to regulate the online world. So everything was seen of it, including myself. We all saw it from the personal data or perspective. But the truth of the matter is that when, when, when we look at this in the experience online, the concerns are about manipulation, the concerns about bias, and the concerns about are about privacy. And I think that we should not underestimate the concerns in the public and the concerns of policymakers. Having said that, we have to have the ability to come up with solutions and together as an industry be able to explain why the solution is not to ban targeted advertising, but to, to make sure that there's no manipulation, that there's no bias, and then there's no privacy violations. And in that sense, we have an opportunity to continue, uh, first of all, to give us rules to our, ourselves and also within the context of the DSA, but to really continue to focus as well on, on user control, transparency, and the user. I come back to the same concept because I think it's important, which is user experience, a better user experience for, for our users. Because when we look at the study of IB Europe, we ask people, we've done it a few times, right? We've asked people, what would you like? What, what do you think about ads? The first thing they say is that they like ads that are relevant. They hate ads that are not relevant, right? So it brings us back to the 90s with non-relevant ads that no one liked. So first of all, people like relevant ads and that's targeted ads. The second point is that they prefer a world where there's the in, when they see the internet that is still essentially for free in that, you know, you don't pay for the service per se. It doesn't mean that no one else pays for the service like in television uh, or cable, right? But, but it, television, the free television is not free indeed. But so in, in that sense, we keep, if we keep asking users that they do believe in, in, in advertising that is relevant, but let's just make that advertising relevant work for them. And we do know that our small businesses are heavily dependent on this. I, I want to say that when, and the last thing I want to say is that when we see these calls for bans, which we're seeing in the parliament, some of the members of the European parliament that actually have signed to these petitions, then when they talk to you individually, no one, the majority of them do not have this perspective. But we have to make it a lot easier for the public and policymakers to really defend the business model. So we have to make more efforts to make this also simpler for them to defend. I, I agree. And, and, and to somehow pick apart the, the perceived connections or elucidate the perceived connections between online advertising and, and online disinformation and hate speech and the amalgamation of these things in a way that, that makes one reach for extreme solutions. Stevan, how about you on the proposed ban and 
what the smart way is to, to get to an outcome that's better for everyone, including users. I wouldn't, I, I think Marisa was so, was so comprehensive. I wouldn't really have anything, anything more to, to, to add apart from th there is probably something that we as the industry are not doing enough and are not, are not strong enough on. And if these kind of proposals are being discussed and going back to the first question, is this an opening, another opportunity for us? Yes. Yes, it is because if you have a regulator that is discussing this, the ban of a model that, that proved economically sound, yes, it was misabused. Then we have an issue and probably the best way to address this issue through smart transparency, I, I, I believe, which is better user experience, clearer information, and probably the way the, the ultimate obstacle we are facing there is, is probably that when we are designing all this stuff as the industry, we go straight to the law and law is very prescriptive. Mm -hmm. So when you put everything that you, that the law tells you to put out, you get a very long list of, of information. And, and again, sometimes it's just, it can be, a, I'm going to repeat this inflation of, of information. It's all about smart transparency. There you are. Another sentence to remember. Yes. Yes. All these quotable quotes, quotes. Well done. Please, any, anything to add to that? Yeah, it's a little bit of a, this, this issue that I was also talking about, this kind of impatience that the regulator seems to have, because if you just look maybe at consent layers, sort of layering on top of each other, they don't really create that transparency, maybe that a lawmaker would like to see. And I, I have to agree, that's something we need to clean up as an industry so that we actually take it step by step. If I actually just look at the study that what Marisa was uh, just mentioning, just take the, the phrasing, for instance, even as, as we discuss now here, Apple's ATT tracking, let's say window, if it would say, are you allowing tracking, pay for the servers instead, because ultimately the, the, if you are not allowing tracking, this service will die as a publisher because it's simply not going to, uh, going to monetize it. I think if you just think about it till the end, I think then a ban of, of that type of advertising is not particularly smart in terms of bringing this, bringing this over. It is important that we are able as a publisher, specifically in the news area, we have a lot of, let's say, journalistic content, content from RTL side and, and from the magazine uh, publishing business of G&J, for instance. And these services are simply not the ones that a user would initially would pay or a, a big sum. So you would actually die. The pluralism in Europe would die um, uh, uh, and starve out due to uh, then the disability. So I think you need to really look at the consequences and then you would come up to maybe some smarter uh, solutions in terms of making it more clear why uh, tracking or targeted advertising or um, addressable uh, television, for instance, actually makes sense because the user is actually now more and more in a digital age being used to actually getting more customized and catered for solutions. Free TV, as Marissa says, is maybe ad-funded TV, but as, as the same as Facebook is also, let's say, an ad-funded business, the, the question is really how do you make that, that service really and audience uh, stickiness work? And that actually is a consumer choice because he would not like to watch TV uh, as a whole, or have an online video or a, a social network uh, in front of, it, um, of a user if it was not adequately served to him in terms of his uh, offering and service. So I think we have this sort of joint line of interest here that a user needs to be satisfied with the service provided. And I think that's where the regulator needs to give us also a little bit of trust in actually knowing what we want to actually offer our customers. And in the return, we actually need to give the regulator the comfort that the user has the control and if we are transparent towards them and that we are also able to sanction bad behavior as an industry. I think that's really important. Similarly, as it then goes into the content uh, area for illegal or harmful content, etc., we have a responsibility. We as a publisher take this responsibility. We've done this all along in actually making quality content in there. And the same applies to the advertising. We have to have the right advertising and the good advertising that is ready for the customer and for the customers of Group M or, or, or anyone so that we actually create this bridge. You've all eloquently made the case and, and I hope we'd be able to enlist you 
for the, the out, continuing outreach to the EU institutions over the coming months on, on the DSM, DSA and indeed the other files. For the moment, we, we need to wrap up. Thank you very much for your, for your time, Elisa Jimenez, Chris Nerka, and Stefan Rangelovic. And I believe we have to move on to the, to the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Marisa, Reese, and Stevan, for this distinctly incisive look uh, into the transparency in uh, digital advertising and how this translates in the context of the EU legislative discussion on prospective DSA.